Hello everyone, my name is Michael Obdenaka from Brooklyn and today I'm going to talk about using Visual Studio Code for embedded Linux development. So, uh, to introduce myself, I'm the founder and an embedded Linux engineer at Brooklyn, which is an embedded Linux engineering company. We are specialized in low-level developments, uh, kernel, bootloaders, working on embedded Linux build systems, we do boot time reduction projects, implementing secure booting, uh, graphics layers, and many uh, other aspects that are low level enough, right? Uh, contributing uh, to the community uh, is what we try to do as much as possible, through code, of course, um, with um, experience sharing, like in such conferences, but also uh, by sharing all our training materials freely online through a free documentation license. Uh, I am also the current maintainer of the Elixir uh, cross-referencer, which is a tool to index the source code of Linux, U-Boot, and Busybox through an online interface. So check it out if you're interested in such projects and in browsing source code. I'm always interested in discovering new tools and sharing my experience and the learning experience with the community. And what's special about this talk, I have to admit, it's the first time I'm speaking about the Microsoft tool. And actually, so far, I've only used Microsoft tool, tools with the purpose of replacing them. So I initially proposed this talk after stumbling upon a survey from Stack Overflow from last year, uh, stating that Visual Studio Code was uh, ranked as the most popular development environment in the survey, uh, with more than 50% of the respondents claiming to use it. So that's an impressive number. And I was actually looking for other tools, uh, other editors, but I eventually was amazed by this number. So I wanted to know more about that. So let's start with a disclaimer and the goals of this talk. First, I'm not a Visual Studio uh, Code guru at all. I'm just learning. But after hearing about VS Code also from many uh, Bootlin customers uh, who started showing the tool to me, I wanted to do my own research on it and share that with you. So uh, the main focus of this research was to find out to what extent VS Code can help with embedded Linux development tasks and also how it compares to the Elixir cross-referencer that I've been contributing to in terms of code browsing and indexing. So uh, please share your experience while uh, this pre-recorded talk is playing, right? Uh, by posting questions uh, and comments, right? And I'll be available during the talk, on the chat, and also after the talk, of course. Uh, I'm most interested in your feedback and your experience too, as this is relatively new for me. Thanks. Let's start by uh, an introduction to Visual Studio Code. It's hard to beat the summaries from Wikipedia, so here it is. So Wikipedia says that Visual Studio Code is a free source code editor made by Microsoft for Windows, Linux, and macOS. Features include support for debugging, syntax highlighting, intelligent code completion, snippets, code refactoring, and embedded Git. Users can change the theme, the keyboard shortcuts, references, and install extensions that add additional functionality. The first release was made in 2015, and over the years, over 16,000 extensions were developed by the community, showing how extensible, easy to extend the solution is. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that this is not a free software or open source project. Uh, you can check on the interface itself. Uh, the license is stated as a Microsoft proprietary license. However, uh, most of the project is still based on the VS Code open source project from Microsoft, which is under the MIT license. So check out this GitHub repository where most of the source code is. So what are the issues with uh, Visual Studio Code? The first one is telemetry. Visual Studio Code collects usage data and sends it to Microsoft. Uh, there's a link to the Microsoft privacy statement in the tool, but it's all about uh, Microsoft products and doesn't reveal anything specific about the data collection in VS Code. However, this can be disabled by tweaking the user settings. Just look for telemetry that's very uh, easy to disable. And anyway, the source code uh, for this data collection is available. Another issue is with the extensions uh, marketplace. So um, the issue is that Microsoft prohibits non-Visual Studio applications from downloading binaries 
from their extensions marketplace, the Visual Studio Code marketplace. So you can't uh, implement a third-party alternative that fetches from the Microsoft marketplace. Uh, you can see that in section 1.b of their marketplace terms, it's very explicit. I find this disappointing as most extensions are open source anyway and not developed by Microsoft. So as a consequence, the extension owners have to push their extensions to other extension re registries too, and that's manual, that's not automatic. They have to do that explicitly. So as I'm always looking for 100% um, open source solutions, I looked for one and I, I eventually found VS Codium, which is a 100% open source build of Visual Studio Code with uh, telemetry disabled essentially and uh, proprietary extensions disabled too. Uh, the strengths uh, of this project is that it's making a very frequent updates, staying in sync with the latest VS Code base very quickly. So as soon as there's a VS Code um, release, a new release, there you get a VS Chromium uh, update very quickly too through the repositories. So that's really impressive. Um, it has limitations though like it doesn't have all the VS Code extensions as indeed it cannot use the same marketplace as I will explain in the next slides. Um, it also missed some extensions I found under VS Code that I found useful for um, embedded Linux development such as device tree, kconfig, embedded Linux, Linux kernel dev. And another issue was that in particular C and C++ support is apparently built in according to the documentation but doesn't work out of the box as it does with VS Code. Like uh, when I imported a, a new project, um, a C project, normally in VS Code, it just uh, detects that, proposes the C, C++ plugin, and there it, go, there it goes, everything is ready to be used, but it didn't work out of the box with uh, VS Codium. So I could do a few things to improve this, but that's probably due to my limited knowledge of VS Codium. Uh, so that's a project definitely worth supporting and I will continue my investigations with it. Uh, but since I had limited time, I decided to stick to VS Code for the moment and really understand uh, what features it can bring and then we'll see about the, the alternatives to it. Before we dive into uh, the capabilities of VS Code itself, I have to mention other related solutions that I found during my research. One of them is the Thea IDE. Uh, from the Eclipse Foundation, which is a completely different project, uh, still supporting all VS Code extensions, but having its own architecture, being more modular and allowing for more customizations, according to their developers, of course. It's also designed from the ground up to run on both cloud and desktop, and I'm not sure that's the case with uh, VS Code. So it's developed and hosted by a vendor neutral open source foundation and not by a single um, company, as, it, as is the case with VS Code. It's uh, now adopted in many IDEs across the industry, such as the new Arduino Pro IDE, ARMS Embed IDE, Eclipse J, which is a flavor of Eclipse, and the proprietary um, Web IDE from SAP. Uh, another related project is uh, Eclipse Open VSX, uh, which is a vendor neutral open source alternative to the Visual Studio Marketplace that solutions such as VS Codium and Thea can use. There's a very nice article actually right here on uh, the um, introducing you to Thea Open VSX and the limitations that are brought by the um, VS Code. Uh, the Visual Studio Code Marketplace. Last but not least, here are some terms that you will find when you read documentation about VS Code or when you go through its menus to explore them. Um, so the first one is IntelliSense. It's a generic code completion tool that, that's built into Microsoft Visual Studio and it appears in support for all types of languages. Uh, there's nice documentation about it in here. Another one is Emet, but uh, it's shown in the interface, but apparently it's for web developers, so that's not for us here. Uh, and the last one I wanted to mention is the Language Server Protocol, which is a new generic open protocol for communication between code editors and IDEs, so that when there's a new language to support, um, you don't have to create a new communication scheme between the IDE and the editor. Uh, Wikipedia has a, a worth checking page about that. 
The first thing I want to show you is how to install VS Code on Ubuntu. Then I'll quickly guide you through the interface and its various components. I also show you how to disable telemetry and I will just show you the most important shortcuts in my opinion. So here's how you can install um, VS Code on Ubuntu 2004. Uh, it get could be different uh, with other distributions. In the case of Ubuntu, it's available as a snap package. And then the package name is just code. Okay, yes, here it says that you don't have like uh, classic, con you have classic confinement and not a security sandbox that would be better in terms of security, but let's go ahead and do it. So I just add minus minus classic code. And there you are. So here's what the um, interface looks like when you start it for the first time. Well, I already started it, as you can see, because there are files somewhere that are open. So, well, you have a welcome page with summaries, um, information, documentation, shortcuts, etc. That's that's quite nice. So you have like the code explorer here for for product code. Then you have uh, a search and replace uh, functionality, which is quite quite good actually. So I like replacing hello uh, by hello in a, in a set of projects. Just works fine. Uh, so it finds the projects that are applicable and, and does that. Um, then you have the um, source control window that um, for a repository can, can work with Git typically. Then the debugger window, uh, at least the debugger button, and then the extensions that are available. So here you see all the most popular extensions, uh, uh, apparently. Um, right. Then um, I wanted to show, um, yes, here you have like the um, settings part. That's where you can set your settings. Here it's time to disable telemetry, so I'm going to show you how to do this. It's very easy, you just input it and disable it here. So there should be no more reporting uh, to Microsoft in case you don't want that. And last but not least, I wanted to show the shortcuts. The most important one, in my opinion, is Control Alt, Control Shift P, like uh, palette, command palette. It shows you uh, various tasks that are available, like uh, to build uh, a project. And that's the second shortcut I would recommend, which is Control Shift B, like build, right? And then of, of course there are other ways, other ones you can customize. Uh, you have plenty of choice here. This is very flexible. Now I will demonstrate the CPP tools extension for the C and C++ languages. Uh, once again, if you look at the interface and the description of the extension, you will see that the license is proprietary, but uh, once again, based on MIT license code. So. I will open the Linux kernel source directory and then VS Code will propose to install the plugin, which I will do. And then I'll show you the features uh, of this plugin. Uh, first, looking up identifiers as I would do in Elixir, um, testing the expansion of defines and also starting to type code and try auto completion as proposed by the IntelliSense mechanism. So here I opened um, VS Code again on uh, the Linux kernel source directory. Um, I started browsing a little bit. Um, I get a few warnings I can dismiss. Uh, normally, when you open a C file, a C source file for the first time, it pops up and automatically suggests to install the C uh, C++ extension. But here, uh, I've done that before and it doesn't want to bug me with uh, the same suggestions so I would have to install it manually but it comes next uh, very very close to the to to the top so here it is I can install support for that that was quick uh, I don't want that and I can go back to browsing the code again there we are So now it takes a bit of time for uh, VS Code to index the source code. You see, you can see this, it's, it's scanning. So it's ongoing. Um, 
like if you uh, look at the uh, definitions here they're not available yet so let's wait a little time before this is over but it's making progress usually it happens even before you realize it you you start browsing and while you're doing that uh, the indexing is over okay I'm back now um, I wanted to show the, now that um, information about symbols is available like this just pass the mouse over the symbol and uh, you get the information what's nice too is that uh, you have also um, define expansion it's really nice very very convenient um, actually to to make this happen uh, I also also had to accept the update or maybe the installation of extra um, settings so I just accepted the suggestion that I was given and now uh, we have like the uh, code information right right here of course then you have lots lots of more detailed things like go to declaration definition references um, all this uh, go to uh, switch header source um, like that right okay so you go to another uh, the corresponding header uh, mem.h corresponding to mem.c and that's about it oh yes now I can I can show you how we can uh, edit the source code of course <coughs> using auto auto completion so here if I want to add a print k it will show me the, the possibilities and the prototype uh, but I can also use the same command device create and see all the commands that match like this one so you see the prototype here I don't know exactly how to expand it but there must be a way right that's about it for the moment uh, you see that uh, indexing is still going on but I, I did that again uh, actually on uh, on the project it's uh, apparently I guess it gives priority to the file that the files that are being explored so that this way uh, you always get uh, similar information uh, once you're browsing a given source file so that's very convenient too so that you have a fast response for all your requests next I will show you the Vim extension it's available under an MIT license as most extensions do and you will see that it's easy to enable all commands seem to work as usual you feel like at home with Vim uh, note that other extensions also exist for other editors such as Emacs, Atom and many others. Well now I want to show you um, the Vim extension. There we are. Vim. Vim emulation for Visual Studio Code. Let's install it. Hey there we are. It's enabled globally so everywhere it should be available. So <clears throat> let's go and try to edit our code now using features of edit of VI. So I'm, I'm moving the, in the code with the, the J, K, L, uh, H um, keys. That's great. They work. Let's try to delete this, uh, this word. CW. Yeah, it does work with VI commands. Uh, and the last one thing I like is also rectangular selection so let's see if this works so it's control shift uh, control V now oh, wait, wait I probably made a mistake control V there you are yes it does work almost at least yeah kind of it it works uh, so apparently so now um, I can it's not as rectangular as I used say I'm used to have uh, but almost <laughs> then I can delete that and undelete that of course with undo so it seems to work mostly <coughs> well we don't want to explore the all of uh, Vim but uh, at least I'm back to my editor for editing the code I'm uh, feeling at home now the next extension I want to show you is called check patch lint it's available again uh, under the MIT license 
what you need to do is first install the checkpatch.pl script on your system coming from the Linux kernel source directory. And it's very useful to create code that's compliant with the Linux coding style and rules right from the start. So directly in the editor, you get um, feedback from checkpatch if the, something is not right in the code you're creating. Of course, you can also post-process your code with this and see the checkpatch report. So let's install the check patch extension. Patch. There you are. So to actually use it, you have to install a check patch uh, on your workstation, or maybe provide a link to cop copy it from the kernel sources to somewhere on your workstation. Uh, I already did that. So now it's just a matter of exploring the source code with check patch. So I'll do that. Actually, if I go back to the uh, properties of the extension right here, you see properties. Um, I'm supposed to enable it. So it's, it's not only installed, but I need to enable it explicitly. Right. And now I can go back and explore the, to explore the code. So now I open another <coughs> file, a control and shift P to run a command. Uh, check batch selected by, there we are. So I'm going to check batch uh, on this file. <coughs> and now you see lots of warnings appear. Um, right here, which one is that? Oh, okay. Uh, two ones, we prefer PR info to um, print K uh, current info. That's recommended now as print case duplicated. And there's also spacing, um, there's a space prohibited between function name and open parentheses. So I should, we should take that, that away, right? <coughs> I could run check patch again from the, the, the commands, uh, control shift P again, check patch. And at least uh, <laughs> this should be gone. Apparently, I need to save, I guess. Save. Control Shift P. Check. Oops, sorry. Wrong command. And now there's should be only one. Yes, the only one problem that's reported. The, so you see the check patch errors that actually reported by being underlined in blue, uh, a bit like syntax um, syntax checking, synt no, spelling checking, but with a blue color. So here you can see where all the, the issues here, they're reported in the problems as well. <coughs> and by the way, I failed to say that there are uh, a few issues with the kernel sources uh, it cannot find some generated .h files, and that's expected, of course, because they are generated. Um, so there are probably things to do to properly support the Linux kernel sources, like uh, maybe either generate uh, the headers ahead of time or well, do something else. This is something I, have, I haven't figured out yet. Another resource I found is called kconfig syntax highlighting uh, with MIT code again. But it's just for syntax highlighting in the Linux kernel and bit root configuration parameter definitions. There's no uh, support for symbol lookup. I'll compare that to the more advanced capabilities of Elixir in that field. So now I'm going to show you um, syntax highlighting for kconfig files. So you see you have syntax highlighting by default with make files, uh, at least for C and C++. If, but if you go to kconfig, nothing happens. So uh, let's go ahead and, and look for the extension that's missing. Okay, config. <coughs> there it is. So let's install this one. Let's install this one. Uh, enable it. Right. Go back to the code. Uh, if I if I open kconfig now, there you are. Syntax highlighting. However, it's just syntax highlighting. It doesn't help, for example, to do something about uh, the settings and see where they are used, for example. And this is this is in contrast to what you have 
with uh, Elixir. So I'm, I'm going to fire Elixir and show you what kind of information you get with Elixir uh, compared to this. So there I am. I open Elixir on um, drivers char kconfig and this time you can see that for each you have syntax selecting as well that uh, we contributed if I remember correctly and uh, to um, to the uh, the printing print project um, f forgot about the name exactly uh, so now here for each uh, symbol here you have um, a link right uh, to each parameter and you see where in which kconfig is defined so that's exactly where we were but also where it's referenced um, especially in the make file so here the reference it re reference thanks to dependencies I guess what is the that's the definition itself but there's probably a dependency somewhere else depends on printers so you can see the dependencies on that parameter and and also where it's used um, in the make files typically here so you see you, you see where it's used to what file it's been used for uh, for compiling uh, and the same applies to other settings in make files so you can click on those and see which how this one is uh, is defined so that also helps to explore the make files themselves right so that's something we don't have in um, VS code yet hopefully one day another extension that I found is called embedded Linux kernel dev extension it's also licensed uh, with the MIT license. It's trying to uh, support symbol compilation, function and symbol navigation for C, kconfig, devconfig, .config and device tree files, so all types of kernel files. And it's trying to add automation to match device tree compatibles and open their respective driver or documentation files. Like Elixir, it's based on universal syntax, but it's less advanced than Elixir, as we will see. So I'm going to install this new extension. So it's called Embedded Linux Kernel Dev. There we are. It's installed. We enable it, and then I'm going to show you how it um, it tries to um, match to find the, the device tree compatible definitions. So um, let's look for a file. So the easiest way to look for a file in a project, you ha you go to the command palette. Uh, control shift p you actually do a backspace here don't you don't you want to look through uh, commands but rather through files so backspace here and then you you get a chance to to look for files by name so here i'm going to look for some fid3 dtsi that's i want to go to now i'm going to look, I'm going to look at oops Control F, sorry. Uh, so looking for uh, SPI, I know what I'm looking for, of course. <laughs> so that's this one, right? So that's this uh, compatible string. I'm gonna try to use this to uh, go to the definition of it. Oh no, device tree doc from compatible. And there we are. <coughs> Let's wait. There we are. So it found what it found was at mail flexcom.h and I believe it's actually wrong because it just um, it's probably a mention of this string inside this file spi uh, oh, spi yes that's an example here but it's suggested child node to the main child that to the main node that's been demonstrated so here uh, the binding is for uh, flexcom not for uh, atmel uh, spi so here we have a false positive it's it's fine does fine does find the the <coughs> the the, um, the um, compatible string in uh, the binding but not at the right place so that's the one that this one that should match so actually it's uh, somewhere else and let's use elixir to to see that otherwise uh, let me just close this get back to the original file and then look at device device driver match from compatible and see if this works at least you see there's syntax highlighting for device tree 
which is good. And here there's another one, um, XFD core. So if I look for SPI, so oh, oops, I don't know. Yes, there we are. <coughs> I'm not sure I got the right one. I should look for compatible. No, nope, doesn't seem to match. Uh, I don't know why this one matched in particular. Um, okay, so that's not completely perfect. It's not very mature yet. So it needs perfecting. Uh, so let, now let's have a look at how uh, this is handled by Elixir instead. So I've opened the DTSI for uh, sam 5 v 3 right? Um, I want to look for the SPI, SPI node. That's right, that's the one I was looking for. So here uh, in, in Elixir as well, you have a, a hyperlink corresponding to th this compatible string. And let's see if it works. So the definition is actually the implementation, like the driver implementing that uh, compatible string. Um, so there you are, that's the SPA at mail driver as expected. So there's no, you don't have the false positive that you had before. Um, Effectively, this we still find the the one that was found by uh, by VS Coast Virtual Studio Code, but Visual Studio Code and Virtual Studio. Um, but that's a that's also a false positive here, uh, I believe. Um, so here it actually should be that's the right answer here for that's the binding for the SPI at mail driver, right? And then what you also have is all the device tree sources that or device tree source includes that make a reference to this uh, compatible string. So all the boards are, are essentially all the, um, the SOC or board devices that, that use this particular compatible string. So that's useful too. So um, Elixir has the false positive as well, and I report that, uh, but at least it also has the correct uh, information. Uh, next, I'm going to quickly show you GitLens, which is a quite exhaustive extension for Git uh, access and management. Uh, it's a MIT license as well. I'm just going to show you the Git blame feature, which I find useful when working with kernel code, but otherwise there are countless possibilities related to Git so now it's time to show um, a few details about Git integration. Uh, the first thing I wanted to show you is here. It shows actually the changes that have been made. Uh, right. Oh, yes. So here you can see the diffs between the original version and the, uh, and, uh, sorry, the or original version and the new one. Uh, what happened is that we fixed the checked back issue, if you remember. So now it could actually uh, create a commit out of that, out of, the, out of that change. It's also, um, I can actually discard a change if I want. Let's do it. You see, it's nice. So th th this is out of the box, uh, git support from, um, from uh, VS Code, right? You could also update, uh, get the latest changes from uh, mainline, from upstream. Let's do it, yes. Please. So it takes a bit of time. Shouldn't be so so slow because we there are probably not many changes to 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 check. And that was done. Um, all right. So I guess it pulled some some other files. Uh, I could see, um, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. And Git is a very huge topic and you, you you can assume that it's pretty well covered uh, what I want to show is um, an extension that's well known it's git lens there you are so it's supercharged the git capabilities built into visual code studio visual visual studio code sorry so there we are let's install it it's uh, immensely popular as you can see 
In particular, it's going to show um, uh, git blame information for the code. So there we are, it should be ready. Get back to the code. Uh, I'll, I'll select a, a file and we'll be back with you. So, sorry, I'm back. Um, I opened the block IOCTL.c. I'm trying to uh, use uh, git blame, for example. Um, and I just, just after enabling uh, git lens. So here, when I click on the line, you can see here in gray, or you, you can see a, a description of the commit that corresponds to it, to this change. Uh, so you know who last changed that line. Uh, so you even recognize the photo of Arne Bergman, if you know him, um, that may be a Gravatar or something like that. And then you can click on, uh, you also have that, have that information right here. So on every line that you click on, you see who last modified uh, the file. So um, and then you can go to here and uh, see the changes associated to that commit. Uh, no, I oh, no, sorry, uh, my mistake. You have to go. You can go here and do um, show commits in search commits view, and that's the commit we want to check. And you can see the changes in the files, right? Corresponding the difference between the original file and the modified file. Nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's really nice to have such integration directly in uh, VS Code. So git blame very easy to run <laughs> this time next i'm going to show you how to cross compile the linux kernel uh, inside vs code so i'll show you how to set the environment for cross compiling in the terminal and using the terminal to configure and build the kernel here uh, vs code doesn't add much value here cpp tools could help finding tool chains uh, setting up the environment maybe for linux kernel but i guess a more dedicated extension would be more suitable than a generic one, but it doesn't seem to exist yet. So now I'm back in the Linux kernel source directory, and what I want to do now is just compile the kernel. So um, I haven't found anything special uh, yet to compile the kernel, so um, you can do it though in uh, VS Code just by opening a terminal. So there we are, there we are, and it's uh, business as usual. So I need to check the target architecture, the target compiler, which was already set. Right, there you are. I can make the terminal a little bit bigger. Not, notice that uh, the terminal is automatically open in the, <coughs> the directory corresponding to the project. So that's the right directory. I can run make menu config. Hopefully uh, the terminal is wide enough. Yes, it is. So I can check various things. Um, actually, I don't have the right setting. So uh, I'm going to run make some A5 dev config because I want to compile the kernel for the same A5 D3 explain board. <coughs> There we are, so now I can check the system type and it's the right one. So I could make further changes, of course, and then just make uh, running multiple jobs in parallel. And then here it goes. Obviously, it will take a bit of time. So here, nothing really special about kernel compiling. Um, you just have the convenience of directly uh, being uh, having a terminal in uh, the right project directory. Um, and there you are. Uh, you don't have any special highlighting for warnings, uh, I guess, in the terminal output. That's something that you might get. Um, but then, it, of course, you can't expect that from a generic uh, C, uh, C++ extension. It should be specific to the Linux kernel, right? So that's it. Uh, we don't wait for the end of the compiled work. 
uh, it's gonna take um, maybe five minutes so no, no need to wait now I'm going to show you how to cross compile a simple C program hello world of course um, so I'll show you how to specify the use of a cross compiler in the interface actually it's just replacing the name of the compiler executable and then I will show you how to define the default build task so that you can easily cross compile compile uh, a program every time you change a line of code right just by pressing a button so now I'm going to show you how to cross compile uh, a simple hello.world file uh, with um, Visual Studio Code, right? So just the, the what you have to do is just uh, define the build task as done here. So I'm going to take the uh, GCC uh, build active file, that's uh, the current file, right? That's very easy. And the only thing you have to do is just uh, customize the compiler, and that should just be enough. So I'm going to find the compiler path in the terminal. There it is. There you are. You can actually see this creates actually a tasks.json file. That's what that's what defines the task, the build tasks, right? So tasks.json. You can save it. Then uh, you move back to hello.c and just run um, run build, build task, which is can be um, run directly through control shift B there you are success uh, so just click on that to close and then I can see I've got um, an executable that's called hello and that has the right type it's a an arm executable so you see how easy it was um, I'm sure you can do that again easily another tool I found is called CMake tools from Microsoft it was actually created by somebody else, but Microsoft took over. So this can generate a template project for you to get started. And a nice feature is the capability to detect cross toolchain, cross toolchains. It calls uh, such toolchains kits, but that's partially broken, as we will see. Uh, there's support for multiple compiling profiles, like uh, building a production-ready executable or an executable with debugging symbols, or to optimize the executable for size or for speed. Another limitation is that there's no example code or CMake files for languages other than C++. I didn't see any uh, C support, any Rust support, and that's missing. So I've just installed CMake tools, the extension, and I'm going to use it on an empty directory here to create a, a new project. So it's a CMake project, so it's easy to do. You, go, uh, you do a CMake quick start which asks you for a project name. Hello, of course, it will be an executable. Um, so it propose to uh, create a CMake list file, right? And that should be all right. So it did create a main file with hello world and a CMake list file. All right, so the next thing I need to do is Control shift p uh, select scan for kits. I'm looking for cross compilers. So it did manage to find some. Control shift p now uh, select the kit. That's the one. So I'm going to use my uh, standard C, uh, C cross compiler. <laughs> there we are. And now the next thing you need to do is uh, CMake configure. So that's, that's going to build uh, the infrastructure to compile my executable on Linux. And now, after doing that, I can do uh, Control Shift P uh, build, C make build. There we are. So let's look. The output it did work. So if I go to the build directory, there's a file that's called hello, as expected. Uh, ouch! It's an x86 uh, 64 um, executable. Uh, so it didn't really take the cross compiler into account so there's something i need to fix i can i know how to fix i found out so uh let me take the path to my cross compiler um linux gcc that's the one i found out that the quick hack is to uh, modify the cmake cache file 
and look for C++, that's the wrong path, you see. It didn't get it right. From this kit, the kit I selected, unfortunately. So if I build again, Control Shift P, C make build. It succeeded. Apparently, it called my terminal, my uh, compiler, and now it's uh, an ARM file. So I need to fix this to understand why it doesn't work as expected. But now I have a CMake, um, a CMake file, and it's ready to. I'm ready to get started with this project. Then the last thing I want to show you is um, something closer to real life, uh, that is remote debugging with GDB server. So here I'll show you how to implement a script to cross-compile code, deploy the generated executable on the target through SSH, and still using SSH, start it remotely through GDB server. And then I'll show you how to customize VS Code for the use of a remote debugger. And then we'll be able to use the remote debugger with all its features like inserting breakpoints through the interface, step-by-step -step execution, reading variables, analyzing a segmentation fault. And that's the first time I use an and in the graphical interface for doing so for driving GDB and it was really a pleasant experience. Uh, special thanks to the author of this article which really helped to get this to work. So now uh, about uh, remote debugging, let me show you what I've done. Um, uh, so first uh, I, I, I'm, sh I'm going to show you what I've, I've defined a t um, some uh, process, some script to actually build my executable cross compile my executable, so it's called uh, Mr. C executable, that's called Vista Emulator.c. I compile it uh, through prep debug uh, sh. So this uh, cross compiles uh, the, the executable, uh, kills GDB server on the target, copies the um, executable to uh, the target through SSH. So here it assumes that you have to set up passwordless access to your board through SSH. Um, this is relatively easy to, to do. Just look at the uh, URL, the article I shared, uh, and then uh, still through SSH, you uh, restart the um, newly compiled application through GCB server on a TCP IP port, right? And this means that the GDB server is waiting for a connection from the host. Now, uh, the way I, I'm gonna show the um, tasks.json, declares um, how I'm, I'm going to build this um, this executable. So here I just had to create a new task. Uh, it's really, I mean, um, VS Code will help you to do that. Uh, you just essentially need to fill the path to your executable. Instead, just, instead of uh, just invoking the cross-compiler, just uh, call your script instead. So that cross-compiles and copies to the target. So you can look at this. It's json.task.json. So that's what I run when I run uh, build task terminal run build task and then um, so let's let's actually run it <laughs> control uh, shift p run build, build task and you see it there's no gdb server for, uh, for the moment this one does not kill it did do the job right in the terminal so it should be okay now. So now I can go and, and actually um, debug my um, my application remotely. And this is done by customizing, uh, creating and customizing a launch.json. Launch.json is always for uh, for debugging. Um, there are a few things that I needed to specify, the target architecture, the debugger, that's GDB. Um, and uh, especially I added, I add, add to um, add two uh, parameters that correspond to remote debugging that's the debugger path uh, here i'm invoking arm linux gdb on on my host so that's part of my tool chain and that's for the um, gdb server address so that's another parameter i had to add uh, there's the target address and the uh, remote port that's all you have to do if i recall correctly you have to mention also the path to the uh, local executable, which is which which was built with uh, debugging symbols, right? So now I can go ahead and actually launch the debugger by just play, pressing start debugging. All 
all right an exception has occurred segmentation fault um, so now I could debug that uh, so that you see it worked it showed me exactly uh, where this happens it actually happens because I'm um, allocating too many uh, buffers and at, after some point of course the allocation fails and there's a segmentation fault because I didn't check the return value from uh, kmalloc so here I could run that again I can insert breakpoints for example by clicking on a line uh, abort the debugger and um, debug it again wait okay now I hit the breakpoint good uh, and it's nice here because you can read um, the uh, values from the variables in this context like file is 0x0 and file name has this value you can read the, the string value from from here so if I had other local variables I could have checked their value so I could step in and run again ah, and then I hit the segmentation fault again I would expect to have to step in multiple times and, and remove the um, the, the breakpoint so if I do that, it would stop and directly uh, hit the segmentation fault again. Yeah, I apologize. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit quick, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm running out of time now. But I, I could, I could change some code um, and and fix the fix the issue, recompile. Like if I. If I recompile the code here, um, I would build it again and uh, be able to uh, debug it again until uh, I manage to get rid of the error, of course. So it just works out of the box if you know how to configure those things, um, how to configure remote debugging um, and set it. I mean, you of course, I uh, here in that case, I built a group file system with build root with a GDB server on the file system and also with SSH, drop bare SSH, so that I could. Uh, directly copy the executable over SSH from uh, Visual Studio Code to um, to the target, right? To the target by using SSH and then restarting GDB server, um, restart retarding the restarting the target executable through GDB server, right? <laughs> but this works. Um, that's quite nice. It's interactive. It's really a nice experience for me to use uh, a debugger in an interactive way, uh, not only from the command line. It's now getting time to draw conclusions. So in terms of pure code browsing, I believe the Elixir cross-referencer wins. Uh, for C, C++, make files, device free files, it provides links to included files, which uh, the current extensions in uh, VS Code can't do. Uh, in the device tree, it supports finding uh, driver bindings, which is just partially implemented in uh, VS Code extensions. Um, there's also full kconfig language support. You can look for uh, identifiers in this space. But however, uh, VS Code would win for uh, exposing Git information, such as Git blame information, and showing in place information like symbol prototypes, expansion of defines, which is much easier to get than through uh, links that you have to click on in the browser. But of course, VS Code offers much more than code browsing. So you have many more features than just in a code browser. Now I would like to share the limitations I found in Visual Studio Code during my research. The first one is that there's no way to filter extensions by license, whether they're open source or proprietary. And I have a clear preference for open source ones, so I'd like to have that option. I have the exact same issue on Android, by the way. An issue with CPP tools, like that is a C and C++ support, uh, I observed clogging the CPU or maybe the I.O. looking for the declaration of soft symbols. Uh, I had to close VS Code to end this. This is quite rare though, but I noticed that some other people report this kind of issue about uh, when they rate the extension. Another issue, which is the, um, the outcome of this research, is that there is a current lack of extensions for embedded Linux, um, like, like applications and tools. So support for cross-compiling tool chains, Support for Valgrind, except output syntax highlighting, that's just that. Support for strace, ltrace, yocto project, build root. There's nothing for kernel modules. There's no serial ports, uh, serial port emulators that I could find. Um, so currently the VS Code and extensions seem better suited for microcontroller and Arthos work 
there, there are plenty of plugins for that for for embedded uh, microcontrollers uh, for open OCD and things like that but uh, it's m more focused on microcontrollers apparently than for embedded Linux itself but of course that's a gap that can be filled by the community and now come the final conclusions about Visual Studio Code and its suitability for embedded Linux work. All in all, I think Visual Studio still misses important features for embedded Linux development. However, it is very flexible, it's easy to extend, and therefore has a great potential for further improvements. So it's already a great solution for debugging programs, even remotely. It just works out of the box and fine. Well, not out of the box, but just fine. Um, and it makes me feel like contributing new extensions, for example, to support bootlink cross-compiling toolchains. Uh, this will also benefit to more open platforms, VS Code, TIA. So everything you contribute to VS Code can also support to the more open platforms. So think about it. Hey, that's already the end of this talk. Um, it's time for questions, suggestions, any comments. I'll be most interested in your feedback about your usage of VS Code, what extensions you discovered, and I could talk about th those ones in my next talk, uh, in the updates to this presentation. So I'll be um, available for further questions in the time that remains, and also will be hanging around in the uh, uh, instant messaging channels that, that's provided uh, by the conference. Thank you in advance, and thanks again.